So our next speaker is uh, Jamie Fidel. He's the uh, general uh, counsel and the uh, director of the Forest and Wildlife Program for the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Uh, Jamie is a great partner uh, with us folks at Forest Parks and Recreation. We really enjoy working with him and other staff at VNRC. Uh, Jamie has a BS in Environmental Studies and a minor in Wildlife Biology from the University of Vermont and is also a graduate of environmental law from uh, Vermont Law School. In his capacity at VNRC, uh, Jamie is uh, involved with a lot of the natural resource issues. Uh, Tom Barry mentioned his work with the Forest Roundtable, a leading venue to uh, for diverse stakeholders to get together to talk about policy, uh, management, and conservation issues throughout Vermont. Uh, Jamie most recently has been doing a lot of work with uh, municipalities and regional planning commissions and other partners on promoting regulatory and non-regulatory strategies for forest land and wildlife habitat conservation. Uh, Jamie Fidel. Great. Thanks, Steve. So I'm going to roll with the PowerPoint presentation just because I was actually able to pull it off yesterday. And there was about, uh, I think, eight disruptions in power. Um, went back to it, and then I got pretty uh, anxious about saving every two minutes. And uh, also the uh, distraction of my kids found a new sport yesterday, and I was who could throw the hardest snowball at the windows of our house. And so it was, it was a fun day, but um, I'm glad to be here. and. Um, I'm really psyched with this particular topic. Uh, when I was at UVM, I thought I was going to be a biologist, figure out ways to get outside and do scientific research all day, uh, five days a week. And for better or for worse, I became an environmental lawyer and kind of a policy wonk. And, but this theme of how to intersect science with kind of law policy is, is really fascinating, one that I think about a lot. So I just want to uh, share more or less a theme with you today, and that's how to take uh, an integrated approach to environmental policy in Vermont. Give you some examples of what we've done at VNRC, which has been in partnership with many of you in the room, and kind of um, at least explore this model and whether it's one that, that is uh, one that we can implement to an even, even greater degree. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over who we are. I think a lot of you know about VNRC, but if you don't, um, just we do uh, work across the state. Um, we really have four core programs focused on sustainable communities, um, clean water, um, forest and wildlife protection, and promoting a clean and efficient uh, energy future. We've celebrated our 50th anniversary. We were started by farmers and foresters and, and sportsmen and conservation, conservationists who were concerned about land use patterns 50 years ago. And so developed VNRC really to you know, implement um, expertise in research and science and policy, but then also legislative advocacy and kind of education and communication, outreach, uh, technical assistance, grassroots organizing, and also legal advocacy. So we do hit it from a lot of different different perspectives and found that that approach works for us. Sometimes we get buried in how many different approaches we take, but we found that it's to kind of achieve success, you have to be diverse with the strategies. There's no one silver bullet kind of way of advocacy. And so I thought I'd just kind of highlight a couple of the recent successes, and these are not just VNRC successes. It, it was a huge partnership with a lot of the agencies and people who are in this room and researchers. Um, but just to highlight kind of from a policy perspective what's been accomplished recently, um, to highlight what's been in play. And then I'm going to talk about um, some more initiatives that relate more to some of the research that's been happening here at VM, um, the Monitoring Cooperative, and um, that's already been hit on this morning. So I'm not going to read these, just really have them up here for you to kind of peruse as I'm quickly going through it. But on the sustainable communities front, um, there's been a lot of focus on promoting growth centers so that we can keep kind of our natural resource base intact, funnel development into kind of vibrant downtown uh, communities and growth centers so that we have our kind of rural resources that are left to be intact for uh, working farms, forests, and natural resource uh, conservation and management. Um, just last year, there was an update to um, Act 250. That 
that doesn't happen very often, but there was really a strengthening of ways to address strip development, and that's now playing out with um, potentially some debate, but it's working, um, and there's actually some projects that have been withdrawn because they were going to actually contribute to um, kind of sprawl outside of um, designated growth centers. So that's a big change to Act 250, and hopefully one that will, will stay. Um, played a role in the adoption of the Genuine Progress Indicator, Gund Institute, um, a big partner on that, um, and have helped, along with a huge partnership to support the creation of a Working Lands Enterprise Board to funnel investments into the um, our working um, enterprises, working lands enterprises. Uh, the water program, and Kim Greenwood is here, who's our staff scientist and water program director, and a huge force behind um, legislation that's related to improvements to um, kind of how we address water quality in Vermont. Um, Kim and John Groveman, who was with VNRC and is now at the Agency of Natural Resources, were really instrumental in um, helping to pass legislation to declare public um, groundwater as a public trust resource in Vermont. Um, also, Kim's been working on uh, fighting for new protections for wetlands, um, advocated for Vermont shoreland protection law, which I'm going to highlight in a little bit, a little bit more, and in particular has been focusing on ski area uh, development and cleaning up impaired waters from the scope of development that's occurred at some of our ski areas. And in our energy and climate change program, um, you know, huge policy gains in kind of uh, continuing the expansion of the net metering program so that there's build out of residential solar as one kind of renewable energy um, outcome in Vermont. Been coordinating, Joey Miller in our office has been coordinating the VCAN, which is working with over 100 grassroots energy, um, energy groups to really do local, um, kind of rolling up your sleeves and doing what we can at the local town level to promote efficiency and um, moving kind of towards a clean energy future. Um, and Joey helped work on a total energy study, um, which is linked to the renewable portfolio standard that was mentioned before, and that's going to be playing out now as far as looking at the policies and, and pathways to kind of get towards our energy and greenhouse gas goals. <laughs> So the forest and wildlife program that I work on, it just kind of plan this theme that there's integrating diverse strategies, and that's kind of the integrated approach that I'm going to play on. Diverse strategies, diverse partners, and um, usually long-term efforts that are needed to kind of bear out on kind of the policy front as far as getting action. And so these are just some of the, the tools that we implement. And again, it, it kind of takes all of these approaches, at least in my mind, to, to see success. And so I'm going to walk through some examples examples. So we convened the Forest Roundtable back in 2005, uh, 2006, and this was really, I mean, Tom Berry talked about the, the wilderness uh, debate that played out in Vermont, and whether we should have more wilderness in Vermont, and a lot of the monitoring cooperative um, research is looking at research in, in wilderness areas, and it was interesting to hear Tom say that maybe the jury's still out on the scientific side of things, but what he, he was sur surely right about was there was um, a very controversial debate about whether there should be more wilderness. And one of the things that um, I decided coming out of that debate was here we were in Vermont, kind of a lot of different stakeholders who care about forests um, fighting over whether there should be wilderness on something like 40,000 acres of national forest land, while yet at the same time there was kind of a much bigger force at play in Vermont, and that's what we've already heard um, mentioned several times, especially with Secretary Markowitz doing an excellent job talking about the amount of fragmentation, the breaking up of our private forest land. And so the effort of bringing the round table to fruition was to get all the players together to say, look, is this an issue that we all care about? And if so, why don't we address that together and kind of stop fighting over the management of 10, 20, 30,000 acres and look at Vermont holistically. And as a concept, it worked. We started with about 30 invited participants and then blew it open. Just anybody could come and attend. And it's now there's 170 people tracking uh, the status of the round table and coming to our quarterly meetings. We use it to share information, to network, um, and to develop recommendations, in particular um, to address parcelization and forest fragmentation. Um, and there's also a link to educating legislators and the public. 
So we started on the left here by actually getting together and developing the values. And I know this is probably hard to see, but we first started with well, what are the common values that we have? And kind of at the top level of importance, everybody agreed long-term ecological functions need to be intact in Vermont. There needs to be forest ethics and a sense of stewardship for diverse forest values. And we need to consider primary forest-based jobs and keeping those intact. So we went through this and realized that we all had these common goals and they ranked fairly high and we were able kind of to get over the fact that um, focusing on why there's disagreement on issues that we work on and saying, wow, there's a lot of agreement actually, why don't we focus on that? Came out with a final report in 2007. And so there were 27 recommendations. We focused on tax policy and conservation planning and valuation of ecosystem services and long-term sustainability of the forest product products industry. Again, no one silver bullet kind of approach. There need to be diverse strategies. One example of a recommendation, conduct an independent legislative study of current use. Everybody agreed current use is vitally important to keeping Vermont's forest intact and farmland. Came up with the recommendation that we need to examine the goals of the program, see if they're working. A lot of folks in the round table felt that the, the program was lacking and not elevating the importance of significant ecological resources. Obviously, we all know there's, there's a promotion of the working for for kind of timber production values. Nobody was disputing that, but we were saying we need to do more to kind of elevate the ability to manage for ecologically significant resources. And how do we keep the program intact and sustainable over the long term? So here's an example of kind of taking um, kind of what was identified as a, as a policy goal and working through this kind of integrated approach of getting to action that implemented something on the ground. So um, based on the round table's work, and I'd say the interest of some legislators, including um, Representative Allison Clark, who's on the Ways and Means, the Tax Committee in the House, um, out of the legislature came Act 65 in 2007, called for an independent study of, of current use program. Legislative Council hired a consultant. Some of those consultants were based uh, at UVM. Deb Brighton um, also, and David Brin. Um, to review and analyze the UVA program, that the consultants issued a report with data and statistics, the research side of things, heavy on kind of statistics and science of what, how the program was working. Then a 17 member task force reviewed the, the report, held hearings across the state and issued a final legislative report with proposed language. And then just a year later, we saw um, action in the legislature and passage of an act 205 that streamlined the program, improved the administration, and allowed for the enrollment of ecologically significant resources for that management perspective that you could now manage for the attributes of old forest, riparian buffers, natural communities of significant um, statewide significance, rare and threatened endangered species, vernal pools, forested wetlands. A lot of the resources that a lot of you in the room study. So there's now basically this policy that there's now the ability to manage for those resources, but we know there needs to be the ongoing science and research um, to inform what the best management is of those resources. So this is one example of where there was a concept and it was kind of an integrated approach to advocacy, to kind of legislative attention, to promoting scientific rationale and justification for the consideration of these resources and the benefits of the tax policy benefits that come from landowners enrolling um, forest land for these values and timber production values. So on the right here, you can see a whole host of forest roundtable recommendations that related to parcelization, forest fragmentation, um, correcting the, the gaps or strengthening Act 250 to address fragmentation, integrating planning efforts at the local, regional, and state level to better address fragmentation. All concepts where we had consensus buy-in. And now I, I'm gonna show another example of where this is playing out, kind of this integrated approach to getting to something on the ground that will hopefully lead to action. So there was the recommendation track annual rates of parcelization in Vermont. So we were able to secure funding through the North e Northeastern States Research Cooperative, and thanks to a huge partner of ours, Kate Baldwin at NSRC, to create um, a snapshot in time, at least one database of a study period um, between 2003 and 2009 of what the parcelization rates were in Vermont. 
And then we start, started to, be, to share the resource, uh, the, share the results of the findings, because what we found from doing kind of the data-driven research was that there were some alarming um, statistics. We, what we already knew, a lot of us, I think, intuitively would say, yes, parcelization's been increasing in Vermont, but we were able to quantify it and show that actually where the growth is is in small parcels. We're taking larger parcels, creating a lot more smaller parcels. We found that, you know, just over that short study period that we now had 126,000 acres, a new acreage that now had dwellings on them that were undeveloped before. And that between the short study period, the amount of land in parcels larger than 50 acres declined by about 42,000 acres, roughly 7,000 acres a year. And we had huge enrollment, continuing enrollment in current use. Um, why? Because uh, the actual value of forest land, let's say in the category of 50 acres or more, the large um, came close to almost doubling in land value. And so the ability for landowners to hold on to their forest land without resorting to development, um, serious challenge. No wonder the current use is so wildly successful and landowners can receive a fairly high significant uh, tax um, benefit to enrolling in the program. A lot of us feel that that's the fa fair valuation for managing the land um, in an undeveloped status for productive um, values. So we saw some alarming trends and if, if for anybody who wants to uh, come to my afternoon presentation, I'm going to really actually share the statistics and the fact that just in 22 case study towns, we saw 2,750 lots created and uh, 925 subdivisions affecting 70,000 acres. That's in 22 communities. We've got 250, more than 250 municipalities in Vermont. So huge amount of subdivision going on. Um, so. We started to tell the story of that. At the same time, the round table had kind of recommended, well, we need to develop our understanding of where there are contiguous forest blocks in Vermont so we can start focusing on their conservation and analyze fragmentation rates. And so Fish and Wildlife, under the leadership of Eric Sorensen, who I saw here today, uh, utilized a steering committee. They created GIS maps and prioritized kind of mapping of these significant contiguous blocks and also identifying the potential threats um, of fragmentation of these blocks actually coming up with a process for analyzing that. And so Eric and the department and the steering committee came out with a report just this year in 2014, actually highlighting that work. And then what I'd like to, um, I, I steal this from Eric because I think it's so effective, but how do we understand or quantify the fragmentation in Vermont? This visual to me is just, it, it just does so much work just from a, a spatial perspective. Um, this is Vermont on the right without roads or houses um, overlaid in. And then when you build in um, your roads, you start to see where we start to see beginning fragmentation. And then when you build in your E911 housing points, you really start to see what's going on in Vermont. So this is what we need to do. We need to track this over time and understand it. And so we saw action on the ground coming out of kind of consensus thinking that we needed this from a scientific approach. Then there was kind of this round table recommendation of identifying and correcting gaps in Act 250. Um, and I don't have time to kind of talk about kind of where we see um, faults in Act 250 as far as not addressing forest fragmentation. Well, quite simply, Act 250 does not address forest fragmentation as a concept, and it probably should. And so last year, um, just based on uh, Senator Galbraith and some senators' own initiative, uh, they came out with a bill, S100, which had the concept of expanding Act 250 jurisdiction for forest land, um, probably to the detriment of all of us who care about addressing forest fragmentation. The bill was designed in a very aggressive way. It probably captured too much forest land from a jurisdictional perspective as far as what would come under Act 250. There was a lot of testimony against the bill. Um, Representative Ellis talked about representatives who came and testified a lot from the forest products industry against the bill. And you know, um, I was really shocked when John. Jonathan Wood came and testified that fragmentation was only a problem in Chittenden County. And we know that that's, I feel that's not, not the case, but what I want to highlight is the fact that there was a reaction to a bill that had the right concept, but probably an overreaching approach. And the problem was, for those of us who wanted to build kind of a collaborative way to deal with the gaps in Act 250, we were surprised and maybe blindsided by the timing of the Senate's um, focus on the bill. And all 
of a sudden we had the right policy goal, but potentially um, an overreaching approach. And so we need to kind of build a consensus on what is the right from a legislative perspective. Bring the stakeholders together and build that up front. And when, when um, Representative Ellis said that consensus is usually important, she's totally right. It's really hard to go into the State House and expect to pass any legislation if you're just trying to promote a policy goal and you haven't actually built a consensus that's needed among the con stakeholders that are going to test testify in the bill. So what happened over much discussion was it was scaled back, and probably rightfully so, where we now have um, Commissioner Snyder in charge of reporting back in January on what is forest fragmentation, what are the rates, what are the trends, and what are the strategies for addressing forest fragmentation. And it's my hope that this will now allow for a recalibration for everybody in this room who cares about this issue to now get involved and help shape a consensus recommendation on how we can address fragmentation, both from the Act 250 perspective, but also non-regulatory strategies. This is the time now to deal with the issue. This is the opportunity. And Secretary Markowitz did an excellent job of kind of raising the um, kind of, I wouldn't say the alarm bell, but the opportunity that this is right now in front of us. And I'd really encourage all of you to get integrated in, in the process. Just a couple of other examples of this kind of integrated approach. The, the roundtable also flagged this um, integrating existing planning efforts at the local, regional, and state level to address fragmentation. So we worked on convening a statewide summit with the regional planning commissions, professional planners, state agencies, um, some of you in the room to develop a statewide land use action plan to address fragmentation. We then took that out statewide, invited local planning commissions, conservation commissions to come and help us ground truth nine priority strategies. And in the end, we were able to put together this forest fragmentation action plan. Folks can read about this on our webpage. It kind of highlights nine priorities, policies for addressing fragmentation. And I'm going to share some of those in, in my afternoon presentation. But again, we now have a roadmap, but it required a lot of consensus building and work kind of with multiple integrated, diverse stakeholders to kind of get there. And clearly there was kind of this integration of what we know about the science of fragmentation with what are the policy recommendations, and then let's put it into a prioritized action plan, which will hopefully inform Commissioner Snyder's report on addressing fragmentation. So it's kind of coming together from a lot of different integrated approaches. And then as Representative Ellis said, can't forget about the local municipalities. And when we all do our work, we need to think about all the opportunities that are not just at the statewide level, but at the local level, the regional planning level. So we worked over the course of multiple years to put together basically a guide that has the regulatory and non-regulatory strategies for municipalities to essentially um, deal with addressing forest fragmentation. There's model guidelines, uh, regulatory standards, zoning districts. There's illustrations on what uh, good zoning approaches look like. There's all the discussion on the non-regulatory approaches, and this was distributed to every municipality in Vermont. So we're just trying to tease out how much can we take an integrated approach kind of immerse the different levels of advocacy and opportunities in Vermont. Can't just focus at the state level. Have to focus on what's happening at the local level. So to kind of recap, we've got this idea of the round table. We're coming together. We're collaborating. We're sharing ideas. We're hearing from people on, that are doing the research. We have folks from academia. We have folks, partners in VMC coming in, sharing research. But then we're basically making sure the research is done. Um, like we did with creating parcelization statistics to fragmentation mapping. Um, and we're utilizing advocacy to help tell the story of what's happening. We're developing action plans. We're doing technical assistance. And then ultimately, we're getting to testimony, uh, legislation, and policy implementation on the ground. I just want to quickly, because there's been some focus on shoreland protection as another key success that we just had this past year on the policy front that took science and brought it to uh, the action um, uh, level. And so um, what we had is a policy was identified by the legislature and ANR that we need greater shoreland protection in Vermont. And there was support, huge support from advocacy community, VNRC, and a coalition of organizations to help the agency actually get this passed through the legislature. Um, the ANR did the upfront research, um, as Secretary Markowitz already talked about, and was clear about what the science um, was saying and showed that there was a higher biota um, in undeveloped habitat in the shorelands. There was the scientific justification 
Um, Kim and VNRC helped to form a coalition which involved uh, multiple other stakeholders um, that care about water quality and shoreland protection in Vermont. There was a lot of grassroots advocacy and this is one of the messages I want to quickly highlight is um, Representative Ellis talked about what's important when you kind of get to the legislature, but she said kind of consensus is needed. That uh, takes a huge time investment. And then there's also the grassroots advocacy. And that's what we have to work on a lot at VNRC because it's not enough for us to walk into the legislature and say, hey, hi, we're VNRC and we think you should do this. It doesn't work that way. Um, there needs to be consensus and the legislators need to hear from more than just an advocacy group. They actually need to know that their constituents care about the issue. And how do the constituents know if they're not being made aware of the opportunities? And if it meets their goals, if it meets their values, then we need to try and actually get them to turn out let legislators know that this is an issue that they should act on. Without that, the legislation usually will fail. So there needs to be huge support. And so Kim and, and our communications director at VNRC worked on getting at least 50 people who really cared about shoreland protection to come out and testify in a meaningful way. And maybe some of you participated, but that's an opportunity from you all who know why these, these goals matter, why we should be implementing these policies, is to explain why from your perspective and let your legislators know that we need action on it. They need to hear from you, those of us in the advocacy community, only go so far. Um, and so we've got to take an integrated approach. We all need to be involved in moving the policies that we need. There were hearings in the State House. It was a two-year legislative process. There was testimony across the state. There was testimony in the committee, multiple committees. And then after two-year legislative um, uh, attention, the Shoreland Act was passed in 2014, establishing state regulation for guiding development within 250 feet the mean water level on lakes greater than 10 acres. So I kind of want to wrap up here by with some reflections on this integrated approach. Um, science to policy requires a multi-pronged approach. Hopefully um, I've hit on some of the ways to do that. Scientific justification for action usually begins the conversation. That's why it's so important that the research that's going on, that the science is going on, is translated, as Secretary Markowitz said, into something that's understandable by the public. So that there's a, 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 just a basic concept that we can use that's supported by the science. Collaboration among stakeholders is key. Consensus building needs to be done among the, the stakeholders up front. That takes time, that takes effort, and it doesn't happen magically. It's just something that we all need to be involved in. Um, the advocacy is needed to tell the story, to influence the legislators. There's a lot that goes on that um, Representative Ellis maybe alluded to, but it's, it's, it's work, it's meeting with, with chairs of committees. Um, making sure that they don't just have a bill that sits on the wall of the committee, but that they're going to prioritize action. And for those of you who don't know how the State House works, there's only a few bills that actually pass out of committee every year. And that means there's, there's a huge prioritization of what needs attention. And so without a lot of that kind of groundswell of support and, and pressure really to address the issue, it, that bill will sit on the wall. There's the grassroots organizing, and then I think I totally agree with Representative Ellis that the policy making isn't just legislative. There's ways that we're all influencing action on the ground, and that's agency policy. There's legal advocacy, which Representative Ellis talks about, talked about. There's the conservation planning, the land conservation, the land management decisions, the local and regional planning, citizen awareness, more informed research. It, research. it goes on and on. And so um, implementing policy, a lot we sometimes talk about legislation but it's only one part of the package and I think we all know that we need to hit it from a lot of different angles. And I just want to finally say that you know how to bridge the collaboration between the scientific community and the advocacy community is, is a really key topic and that's why I'm so glad to be invited to kind of share some perspectives here today and also just to really echo the importance of this theme. You know, it's not enough to just talk about it today. We need to keep the evolving in our understanding of how we partner and bridge the science and the advocacy. And I guess I would offer as a final thought that I think one model that's really working well is the concept of the Forest Roundtable. Um, the concept of a water caucus, which Kim has just started, um, where there's quarterly meetings and basically the researchers, um, the agencies, the advocacy groups, the watershed groups, the forest, forest products industry interest, planners, 
um, and I'm missing a lot of key stakeholders, but everybody's getting together. Legislators are coming together and there's a sharing of the research and then at the same time, a conversation about the policy and how do you move from what the research is saying to the right policy outcomes and mechanisms having that kind of collaborative discussion so that there's buy-in then when you come up with a recommendation that it has the consensus to move and there's discussion about the strategy on how to get it to move. Doing that together in a collaborative way where we can find venues to do that I think is key. We're testing it with the round table and the water caucus. Um, looking at the amount of 27 original recommendations from the round table and how many have been implemented over half, we're actually seeing that this model works, that it actually has shown some level of success. And so I would offer that as one approach um, that we continue to, to um, advance in Vermont. And it probably needs to happen over um, multiple sectors of interest. And, and I know that there's already a lot of that going on. There's a lot of collaboration and discussions that we all engage in. So by no means am I saying that 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 is just the one right uh, strategy, but um, we found that it does have some success. And so I'd kind of stop there with kind of just this, this endorsement of this integrated collaborative approach that focuses on a lot of diverse strategies for getting policy action accomplished on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. For any questions from someone in the audience? Yes. What's the response been from the local communities to your action plan? So the action plan um, was really um, designed at getting the regional planning commissions to come together. So there's, I think, 13 of them across the state and they all look at kind of policies on our own and we wanted to come together and get the regional planning commissions to endorse these priority concepts. The idea would be then that as um, local uh, plans and zoning is developed on the ground that they would be in, they would be consistent with the regional policies because there's incentives for being in compliance with the regional plan and its policies. So this is just now starting. It's a great question. I can't tell you what the response has been at the local level because we've been focused more um, at, at getting the regional um, entities together to support it. I will say though that the guide that we put together for the communities has been well, very well received because they're volunteers coming together at night after you know cooking dinner for the family and getting everything dealt with. Um, there's usually not a lot of bandwidth to kind of focus on how to really implement um, you know complex um, zoning strategies and so um, the guide has been really helpful to basically outline um, how two steps to get it done. And we've been working with a number of towns now that have read the guide and now are working on improvements to their town plans and, and zoning and subdivision regulations. Thanks again, James. Oh, thank you all.